We were young until we weren't, but the books stay the same. go to the next island which i think is the island with the water that turns things to gold which you know what i wrote in my notes i said my little smarty pants edmund because he goes full-on detective and like figures out what's going on on this island and it's beautiful and i love him and his little analytical mind my boo yeah he turns into a detective and they figure out the water is anything that touches it turns into gold and they see that there's a person at the bottom of the lake of this lake that they find, and that person, they just presume this. He is also a lord of one of the lords of Narnia that they are trying to find, and it doesn't matter. So, <laughs> Now, the entire point of this episode is to show, one, that Edmund is smart and awesome, and two, to show Caspian with his, like, He gets a bit of, of gold fever. Yeah. Yes. Because he recognizes the value that this water can have. And he makes, like, he, he says something like, whoever controls this island will immediately be the richest person in the world. And so he tries to hold everyone to secrecy so that no one else finds out about the island other than himself. And then Edmund's like, well, I'm the OG king. You gotta listen to me, buddy. And Caspian's like, man, you suck. And they're about to duke it out. And then Aslan Deus Ex machinas the shit out of them and, like, makes them forget what they found? It's not quite clear to me. But anyway, he resolves it without any more trouble. Which I think is getting back to the issue that the, the resolutions for Caspian's character arc are just way too easy. We should have seen them dueling. That would have been cool. And then there could have been a nice dramatic moment where, like, Caspian, being older and a king, has successfully defeated Edmund, and he is about to shove Edmund's face into the water. Die, and then that's when Aslan shows up and stops everybody. You know, build up the tension a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Although I will say, I don't think Caspian would have gotten that far, because I think Lucy would have jumped on him. I think Reaper Cheap would have been like, no way, back off. So I think that instead there would have been a mini mutiny. And maybe actually that would have been interesting going forward if Caspian was like, all these people, they chose Edmund over me. Boo-hoo. It reminds me of the premise of Star Trek Voyager, where the crew of the Voyager is sent off like 80 billion light years away from Earth, and their mission is to get back. But right before they got sent away, they picked up these members of a terrorist organization called the Maquis, who are enemies of the federation but they're put in this situation where they have to work together to try to accomplish their mission and so it would have been cool if there had been a divide in the crew that was established that could have like been this underlying tension throughout the story it's a shame because i feel like there's potential there that isn't really realized yes next island next island the duffer island <laughs> So I actually thought for a long time, so like basic story of this island is that they're invisible people. They forced Lucy to go into this magician's house to change them back because they said they were made ugly by this magician and then they made themselves invisible because they didn't want to look at themselves, but now they would like to be visible again. So like they make Lucy, because apparently only a little girl can do this, go into the house and find a spell to turn them back. She goes in, she looks through the spell book, has like a moment where she almost uses this spell to make herself super beautiful because she's envious of Susan, um, doesn't. She does use this spell to basically find out what people are saying behind her back and discovers that this girl she thought was her friend is talking shit about her with another girl. And then finally flips through and gets to the uninvisibility spell, turns them back, turns out the magician supposedly... No, wait, wait, wait. No, what, there's, what, what? There's, there's a spell before... Well, it's not really a spell, but it's a story that she reads. Oh, yes. There's also the story. That I think is important because it, it really plays into the end of the book. Yes, that's true. She reads like a three-page story, I want to say. Yeah. And it's apparently beautiful, the most beautiful thing she's ever read in her life. But like basically as soon as she finishes it, she can't remember it. And she can't turn the pages back in the book to get to it. It's called the Refreshment of Spirit Spell. And it alludes to this story 
of a cup and a sword and a tree and a green hill. And I tried to like piece together what possible story could that be? Was it an Arthurian legend? Is it the gospel? Like there's the cup, there's the last supper, there's the, um, a sword, you know, the garden of Gethseth, Gethseth, Gethseth. Oh my God. I can't. Gethsethamine? That's the one. (laughs) Words are hard. Words are hard. So that it could be referring to that. There's a tree. The cross has been sometimes called a tree. And a green hill. And I'm not sure if that's referring to Calvary or if it's just referring to Jerusalem or it's referring to like the end times when the world is renewed. I'm not sure. But if it is a Christian illusion, it would be strange that like C.S. Lewis would bake it in so that Lucy can't remember the story. Because it seems like that's a story you would want to remember because it's kind of pivotal to achieving salvation. So I'm not really sure what to make of that. Well, I think at the end, um, the sound reminds her of the story at like the end of the world when they're like basically able to hear something from Aslan's country or smell Aslan's country or something. I forget the exact line. And I think that maybe the story is supposed to be I mean, it's hard to say. And I I actually like the fact that, like, again, we can't directly be like, ah, yes, this is the story of whatever, you know? Like, we're having to do some work to, like, think about this and consider it. I've always kind of understood it as, like, I think Lucy gets basically a true glimpse or understanding of probably the salvation narrative in a way that, like, is beyond the mortal ability to, like, hold in her. And it's something that's obviously she's reminded of when they get close to Aslan's country, which is very, very, very clearly heaven. I've always kind of read it that way, is that, like, she is able to, like, experience it. And I think it makes sense that it's Lucy, because Lucy's always sort of the one closest to Aslan. Is able to, like, fully experience this narrative that she cannot hold inside herself and truly remember. I I like that a lot. I think it... In the sense that it, like, captures the experience of the gospel or, like, the the feeling or emotional valence of the gospel. I don't know. That could be interesting. Because Aslan does say later in that scene that it's a story that he will tell her for years and years. Maybe that's just saying, like, it's a story that will be told and retold in many different ways. And, like, I also kind of feel like C.S. Lewis is tooting his own horn here in suggesting that the Chronicles of Narnia are one of those ways of retelling. (laughs) I was like, all right, stroke your dick over there, CS. I thought that was interesting. I liked it too, actually. Didn't mean to interrupt you. I just thought that was a very important moment thematically for this story. Yes, I agree. Thank you for reminding me. But yeah, so she eventually does the spell that will supposedly turn the Duffers visible again and then has a chat with a magician who supposedly isn't that bad Except for the fact that he non-consensually turned the Duffers into these one-footed people, monopods. Which, like, I thought for the longest time C.S. Lewis made up. But no, Clive was, of course, drawing on medieval sources. And I've now read them and I was like, God damn it, Clive, I was giving you credit for this all these years. (laughs) But yeah, so he's like, oh yeah, they were just, like, irritating me and not doing their work. So I turned them into monopods, which, like, you're a But Aslan, yeah, also shows up uh, and talks to Lucy a little bit after she reads in the book. And uh, then they mostly get to leave. There's a little bit of shenanigans with the monopods who are like total idiots. There there are two things. Well, there are two things I think we should remark here. One is that this magician, whose name is Coriakin, Coriakin, something like that. We find out at the end of the book that he is actually a star. Literally a star, like in outer space. That has been brought down to Earth. And the explanation is that he did something bad and he's being punished for it. And the narrative cops out of figuring out a reason why by just saying, oh, you, you wouldn't understand. So it's like, well, that's late. And then there's also, I don't know, 
if this is me reading too much into it, but I, I was curious if this relationship between the duffers or the duffel pots, I think they eventually are called, and the magician, if that's analogous to the relationship between humans and God that C.S. envisions. Because there is one line where um, Coriakin is explained to Lucy their relationship, and he says... One minute they talk as if I ran everything and overheard everything and was extremely dangerous. The next moment they think they can take me in by tricks that a baby would see through. Bless them. I don't know if that's like, if that's CS trying to sort of say like, and that's what humans think they can do with God. I don't know either. I mean, I think that definitely we're supposed to see him as like this voice of reason. I'm mad about non-consensual body modification. But I think that then we also see the Duffers, like, they have their leader who they just repeat, like, everything he says as if it is absolutely correct. So they very much got, like, this Lemmings vibe going on for them. So I do think that that's commentary on, like, yeah, some people just totally believing what someone says, regardless of if it's the stupidest thing they've ever heard in their lives. Even if they contradict themselves, too. Yes. I mean, I think that this could... Be an interesting narrative uh, in today's uh, world. I wonder if there are any real life comparisons we could possibly make to this. So what I want is for one of our visitors. (laughs) Visitors? Wow. Listeners. (laughs) I would like them to Photoshop Donald Trump's head onto one of the duffer bodies (laughs) and send it to us. Make it so. Sir? Do it. I do love Lucy's time with the spell book. I think it's a really, just like in Prince Caspian, we're starting to see Lucy less as like an idealized, perfect little girl and more as like a little girl who does have flaws and is t- tempted by bad things sometimes and like comes pretty close to like using that beauty spell and does use the eavesdropping spell. And her conversation with Aslan afterwards is, is one I enjoy. It's a good moment for Lucy. There are a lot of nice moments in this book. The connecting tissue isn't quite there. That was frustrating for me at times. But individually, each of these stories are fun, interesting explorations of these. It's like it's like a series of short stories. All right. So the next island of importance is the Darkness Island. Yes, the Dream Island. I mean, the title chapter is the Dark Island, so I think we can roll with that. But, oh my god, this was like the scariest thing for me as a kid. And you know what? I think the creep factor of it holds up. Because, yeah, they're sailing into this this pitch blackness, which they don't want to do. But Reba Cheap, who I will say, Reba Cheap's characterization is just always like, literally, he is the most brave, no fear, the most honorable. Like, there is nothing that is holding Reba Cheap back from anything. And I love him for that. But he does it very badly encourage them to go sailing into this absolute darkness. And then they find one of the lords trying to swim away from this island. And they're like, what, what's wrong? He's like, get me out of here. And he's like, what is it? And he's like, this is an island where dreams come true. And they're like, oh, great. And he's like, no, 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 no. Like, your real dreams, actual dreams. Welcome to the nightmare. Bitch. And then they all are like... We gotta get the f*** out of here. (laughs) The way it's described is fantastic. Like, they're hearing sounds, and they're all freaking the f*** out. Except for our little, intrepid Reba Cheap. Which, like, I just want to read this, because Reba Cheap gets so mad when they start (laughs) sailing away. He's like, your majesty, your majesty, are you going to tolerate this mutiny, this paltrudery? Whatever is that word. This is a panic. This is a rout. And the Caspian's like, row, row, pull for all our lives. Is her head right, Drinian? You can say what you like, Reba Cheap. There are some things no man can face. And then Reba Cheap, wonderful little mouse he is, says, It is, then, my good fortune not to be a man. Ugh, love him. Oh, Reba Cheap, you little a- ass. <laughs> uh, but yeah. Just, like, the creepiness of, like, yeah, just some people hearing some things and the island kind of looming in the background as they're desperately trying to get away. Oh, man, it's it's some good, creepy shit. Yeah. So, actually, I, I'm curious if your book, because I was reading about this book, I found out that in the American version, 
he actually made some revisions to oh. the book. And they're mostly small, but there's one big revision that he made throughout this scene that apparently the 1994 version changed back to the original British version, where in the original British version, it suggested that this island was never real because they get out of the darkness and they look back and they don't see anything. But in the revisions that C.S. Lewis made, it's very much so that this island is real. And there is one moment that... Let me see if I can find it very quickly. Because, I mean, your version might not even have this. Yeah, I don't know. I'll just read this whole passage because I, I think this whole passage just is not in some versions of the book. So this is right when they are leaving the darkness. And so it says, In a few moments, the darkness turned into a grayness ahead. And then, almost before they dared to begin hoping, they had shot out into the sunlight and were in the warm, blue world again. And just as there are moments when simply to lie in bed and see the daylight pouring through your window and to hear the cheerful voice of an early postman or milkman down below and to realize that it was only a dream, it wasn't real, is so heavenly that it was very nearly worth having the nightmare in order to have the joy of waking. So they all felt when they came out of the dark. Huh. So my edition is totally different. So wait, let's read them for comparison sake. Woo! <laughs> I'm so interested because actually this is the what version I remember reading and I will I will now read it aloud. So it starts out that paragraph starts out the same. In a few moments the darkness turned into a grayness ahead and then almost before they dared to begin hoping they had shot out into the sunlight and were in the warm blue world again. And all at once everybody realized that there was nothing to be afraid of and never had been. They blinked their eyes and looked about them. The brightness of the ship herself astonished them. They had half expected to find that the darkness would cling to the white and the green and the gold in the form of some grime or scum. And then first one and then another began laughing. Yeah. Yeah. I guess we can speculate about why he made the change. Yeah, I'm like very curious now. I mean, I think that having it be real is more powerful in a way, but also I do like the idea that like they somehow created this all in their heads. I don't think there's like one is necessarily better or worse than the other version. They're just very, very different in what they're saying about the characters. Because your version, it's not real. It was all in their heads. It's just like this moment of existential relief that it never actually happened. So they never had a reason to be afraid. And it sort of vindicates, I think, Reepicheep more. Like he was never afraid and for good reason. And in my version, it's more like the horror, because I guess we haven't said the way they escape. So the way they escape is that basically Lucy says a prayer to Aslan and Aslan shows up first in the form of a cross. A cross? Yeah. Let me read it. I wonder if this isn't in your version either. Oh, wait, I guess. Okay. In my version, here's what it says. So like there's a beam of light that shows up. And it's just like a beam of light. Then Lucy looked along the beam and presently saw something in it. At first it looked like a cross. Then it looked like an airplane. Then it looked like a kite. And at last, with a whirring of wings, it was right overhead and was an albatross. And I want to also just comment here that now having read like five million poems about albatrosses, <laughs> a lot from the medieval period, but obviously there are some more modern ones. I get this reference now, Clive. I've got it. If you've read The Rhyme of the Mariner, I think, by what's his yeah, face? Yeah, Rhyme of the Age of Mariner. Oh, fudge. Which one? Is he? Is that one Coleridge? Oh, God, I can't remember any of their names. Look at us, two literary majors, and we don't well, even know the I don't, name. I don't like the romantics, so <sighs> I tried my best to forget, like, Wordsworth and Coleridge and all of them. Why, you stuck-up, half-witted, scruffy-looking nerf herder. Who's scruffy-looking? Oh, my God. God, Morgan, how dare you? Well, that's okay, because I hate the Victorian, so... You're wrong. <laughs> yes, so look, first, it's a cross, then it's a plane, then it's Superman, a.k.a. Aslan, <laughs> in the form of a bird, a big old bird, and he leaves him out of the darkness. Anyway, the point I was trying to make is that if the islands were real, that gives that moment a lot more weight in that Aslan 
really did actually rescue them from the darkness. But I guess, like, even if it wasn't real, he rescued them from sort of the mire their own minds created. I think that's just as real in a sense. I'm sure there are, like, good quotes on this, but, like, sometimes the, like, prisons our own minds create can be worse. Not always. I mean, prisons are just generally bad, but, like, (laughs) what we create for ourselves in our heads can be just as real, if not more real, than, like, reality. It's interesting because it's, like, is the trauma that they experienced better or worse if it is or isn't real? And I'm, I'm not sure. In my version, it seems to suggest that the trauma they feel is worse because it actually did happen. Um, and in your version, they, they were able to laugh it off and, and dismiss it, it seems like. So the narrative seems to be suggesting that it is worse if it is real. I'm not sure if the laughter is, is just laughing it off. I think it's the joy of now knowing it wasn't real and that they've escaped, escaped from it. And I do think it's a little bit debatable, I guess, whether or not in this version, the Dark Island is real. Because then later on, the Lord that they've rescued is like, never bring me back there. He pointed a stern. They all looked, but they saw only bright blue sea and bright blue sky. The Dark Island and the darkness had vanished forever. Why? cried Lord Fruit. You've destroyed it. And then Lucy says, I don't think it was us. So I think it's it actually kind of leaves it a bit ambiguous about the existence or non-existence of this island. That's a good point. And then it also makes like, maybe it was just that if it was so easily conquered, it would be less horrifying for readers. I don't know. It's it's a curious change for something that is pretty small in terms of the, the arc of the story. But C.S. Lewis apparently thought it was important enough to basically put in a whole new paragraph about it. I never knew that. New things every day. Yes, the things you learn. So I think now we arrive at the last island, the Star Island, which is truly just a a wild moment. (laughs) (laughs) Which, like, this entire book is wild, so... Yeah, everything really goes off the deep end in more ways than one by the end of the book. (laughs) That was a good one. Good job. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, my Reaper Cheap. <laughs> oh, Reaper Cheap. Anyway, so they get to this island and they find this table where the three lords are in this eternal sleep. And there's also like a feast just sitting on the table. And so everyone's kind of puzzling, like, what's this about? Is the food cursed? Have they been cursed? They have like super long beards and everything. Yeah, like, the illustration is they're, like, a mound of hair. Yeah. (laughs) And then sexy babe star lady shows up, and they're all a little suspicious of her because she's just too hot to be true. And they also see the stone knife that the witch used to kill Aslan. This is all a little fishy. Yes, and I want to specifically point out Edmund here because I, I live for Edmund moments. And I like literally my note here because he's the one who speaks up and he says, look here, I hope I'm not a coward about eating this food I mean. And I'm sure I don't mean to be rude, but we've had a lot of queer adventures on this voyage of ours and things aren't always what they seem. When I look in your face, I can't help believing all you say. But then that's just what might happen with a witch too. How are we to know you're a friend? And like Edmund, boy who was deceived by a witch would know. And this is, again, just excellent characterization. I love my boy. He's good. It's questionable if uh, how good of a job this lady does to convince them, because I think basically her response is like, I think Caspian directly asks, how can we believe you? And then she literally responds, you can believe or not. Yeah. And that's it. And then old man star shows up. And that's when things are clarified and they finally figure out, okay, they're telling the truth. They're not bad guys or anything. I think Reaper Chip actually drinks before that happens. Oh, yeah. Reaper Chip eats before he even shows up because he's like, I'm Reaper Chip. I don't care. I'll drink. I'll eat. Literally the most daring little mouse. But yeah, so then we find out this is Aslan's table. It's at the end of the world. If they sail on beyond this, it is, quote, unquote, the beginning of the end. The dad star shows up. And this is when things just go out the window because suddenly a hundred thousand birds show up and one of them feeds the old man a fireberry. 
And then we find out that the old man and I guess the babe are both former stars that were dying. And then they got brought to Narnia to recover. I don't know. (laughs) It's a weird little aside of which I think like the payoff of this is that Caspian ends up marrying the star lady. And I'm pretty sure. I think the only thing I remember about Silverchair is that like. They get married, they have a kid, and I think the kid is part of the main quest of Silverchair. And I guess the the other main takeaway from this is that they find out how to help the lords wake up, which is that they have to go east and then leave one of their party behind in the east, which Reap a Cheap decides that will be him because he had a poem read. And by the way, do you want to read the poem? I know you had a thing about oh, reading I the do. poems. I do. I am making my way there. Here. Okay. Here's the the poem prophecy thing. Where sky and water meet, where the waves grow sweet, doubt not, Reba Cheap, to find all you seek. There is the utter east. Which, I want to say, the entire concept of this is uh, Clive retconning himself because they have to wake the dryads up in Prince Caspian. I did want to say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this makes no sense. Uh... It's fine. Who cares? Prince Caspian wasn't that interesting, so I don't mind retconning that book. Well, and I also like do like the idea. I wish it had been more like less poem prophecy thing and more like an old song like passed down through Reba Cheap's family or something. So that it's like not necessarily a prophecy for Reba Cheap, but like the idea of what might be at the end of the world and that that's somehow always enchanted him. Because I like that idea. I like the idea that he's always been intrigued by this and, like, this is his life mission and goal and whatever. I don't love the actual execution of that. I like that idea. It's it's kind of, it could have been, like, his I'm going on an adventure moment. That would have been nice rather than a prophecy, which is part of one of my problems with the ending. But we can get to that. Yeah. But I guess I, I've always read it less of a prophecy, probably because I myself would like to not read it as a prophecy and more of like this legend or story that this dryad woman has like tailored to reap a cheap for him. Hello, Casey here, interrupting the podcast. Unfortunately, my audio for some reason stopped recording at this point and I did not notice until much, much later. However, in examining the files, I discovered A secret conversation took place, and now I am going to play it here. Warning, some listeners may find what you're about to hear disturbing. There's not much more to say about Star Island, honestly. I think it's just kind of, like, weird. The weirdest part for me, actually, though, is, like, the debate about which of the people on the ship will continue with them. Yeah. And then, like, everyone goes except this one guy who hesitates too long, and then he ends up just being a horrible person. But only because he was afraid of being left behind. And, like, how dare anyone worry about that? Yeah. A weird moment. It's a weird moment. I don't love that moment. I was like, I'd forgotten all about this, and I'm glad I did. But yeah, they go sailing on. There's a lot of, like, interesting descriptions of, like, mer people under the sea. I don't know. They're nice. Mm -hmm. There's also, I will say, there's a funny, like, comedic moment that happens in the middle of all this, like, really kind of fun weirdness. Yeah. Eustace is like, the world's round. We're not going to sail off the edge. And then Caspian's like, do you mean to say that you three come from a round world, round like a ball, and you've never told me? And he gets so pumped. He's like, we have fairy tales in which there are round worlds. And I was like, this is just like a funny moment. Yeah. Well, I think now, unless you want to dwell on any of this stuff, we should probably finally talk about it at the end. I think we've already talked about Caspian's part in it, so we can just kind of ignore that and move on to... The three kids and Reba Cheap sailing off in the little boat. <sighs> I, I'm okay with starting. So the kids sail off and they see this whole country to the east, basically, that like doesn't look really attached. They hear the sound and smell the smell that come out of it. And the narrative tells us, and I actually think this is interesting for an entirely different reason, but Edmund and Eustace would never talk about it afterward. Lucy could only say, It would break your heart. Why, said I, was it so sad? Sad? No, said Lucy. So this is the first time that we get, like, the narrator actually giving himself speech and talking to one of the other children. Like, we always 
always get the impression that he was told this by them, but, like, I just think that's a weird moment. But anyway, yeah, moving on from narrative weirdness, uh, then Reba Cheap goes on alone. He takes off his sword and flings it into the sea because he won't need it anymore. There's this moment with Lucy that harkens back some of the thoughts she's had about him in Prince Caspian and in this book and says, Lucy, for the first and last time, did what she had always wanted to do, taking him in her arms and caressing him. And then they watch as Reba Cheap vanishes over the edge. It's cute. <laughs> I cried when I read it this time. Yes. Now you can talk now that I've been very sentimental. I will give you that it is a cute moment. For me, when I read it, it's like there's a lot of nice, vivid imagery. It all feels very nice. It's like this crazy, splendid thing. But sitting with the book after I finished it, I just felt unsatisfied. The more I thought about it, the more I started to to think, what makes it special that it's Reap a cheap who's the one that goes to Aslan's country? Like, why is he the one that gets to go? And it's like, yeah, he's the adventurous... I'm hunting wabbits. Adventurous one. He has this prophecy told to him that he fulfills. It's And the book itself says, like, it's his fate to go. But... And this is very personally speaking, you know what I think about using destiny as a means for explaining character motivations. Not a fan of it. (laughs) I don't think it's interesting. So the more I was just thinking about this moment, why is it significant that Reaper Cheap chooses to go? And that's kind of when I realized, well, he didn't actually really make a choice or a a choice in any significant sense because it's been established in previous books that beasts don't have free will, you know, and that's reinforced here because Reba Cheap's very (laughs) one track kind of mind. But then also going back to that moment in the dark Island where he is unaffected apparently by, by the mystical elements of that place and he says, well, I'm glad I'm not a man. And it seems to suggest that like he's incapable of nightmares, which would suggest that he's then incapable of evil thoughts, which then he's incapable of evil, really, in any meaningful sense. And if I can refer back to C.S. Lewis's quote about free will, you know, which he was so nice to show up for that episode and <laughs> quote it himself. And actually, I'll play it right here. And free will is what has made evil possible. Why then did God give them free will? Because free will, though it makes evil possible, is also the only thing that makes possible any love or goodness or joy worth having. Though it makes evil possible, is also what makes goodness and joy and love worth having. Reba Cheap is a character who is not really given a choice. He just goes into this other place and it's like it's nice but it's not satisfying because it doesn't tell me anything new about his character it's like eating a tub of candy it's nice and sweet but it's not really Mm. filling so it got me to thinking like what what could have made this this scene for me more impactful It's like, well, maybe if we didn't actually get that moment of seeing Aslan's country, we just saw the waterfall blocking off the view. Maybe it was Aslan's country. Maybe it was just an abyss and Reaper Cheap is falling into it forever. But there would have been some risk, a choice that like, I'm going to make this literal leap of faith and trust that this prophecy that was passed down to me is true and I'll do it. But even then, it's like it still wouldn't have really been compelling for me because it's like, well, of course, Reaper Cheap would be the one to do it. And it's like, what would have been cooler for me? And I know this is probably going to be sacrilegious for you. What would have been cooler for me is that if there was something that prevented Reaper Cheap from going, from being the one to stay behind, you know, maybe he falls off and he gets eaten by a merman or something. Have you no sense of decency, sir? Oh my god. (laughs) No. 
just any anything to sort of stop him from going. And so Lucy, Edmund, and Eustace would have been forced to sort of negotiate among themselves who would be the one to remain behind. And Lucy could have been like, I'll be the one to stay behind because I love Aslan so much. And then Edmund, because this is a book written by C.S. Lewis, would have been like, no, you're a girl. I'm a guy. I'll stay behind. No, Edmund would have been like, no, I was the traitor. So I should be the one to do it. Whatever the case. But then Eustace jumps in and he makes this impassioned plea about how at the beginning of the book, he was just a right bastard. But over the course of his time in Narnia, he's come to learn more about himself and realize the error of his ways. And he wants to make this sacrifice because it would be a sacrifice. He'd be leaving behind his home, his parents, everything he knew to stay behind. And it would have been really effective if we just had no image of Aslan's country. So we just did not know what would have happened to Eustace. It just like going off of CS's uh, Christian agenda here. To me, that would have been a much more effective illustration of a leap of faith, of just doing something out of your own free will, choosing this action of sacrifice. And it just would have been great for Eustace because he's at the start, he's just the most selfish bastard, the most annoying person in all the world. And to have him do this incredible selfless act at the end for people he doesn't know, for these three lords that aren't important to the story in any way possible. And just to take that action of going into Aslan's country, obviously he would have been rewarded with eternal bliss or whatever. But to me, it just would have been such a more meaningful character moment than being like, oh, Reap a Cheap is so cute, and now he's going to live in paradise forever. Yippee! Yippee! That's that's how I feel about the ending. All right, I'm going to quibble with some things. Let's hear it. So I actually agree with you. I think not being able to see Aslan's country would have been more impactful on that front. I I agree. Um, I think they still could have heard something or smelled something. So they knew there was something there, but like they didn't necessarily know what, or you know, what it looked like or how to get there or whatever. I think that there is meant to be some doubt about Reaper Cheap's fate because the narrative specifically says that he vanishes. And since that moment, no one can truly claim to have seen Reaper Cheap the mouse. But my belief is that he came safe to Aslan's country and is alive there to this day. So there I think it's supposed to be some ambiguity about what happens, but I agree that with being able to see it, it makes it a little more straightforward. That said, I don't mind that Reba Cheap's arc is that he wants to do this thing and then he does it. We see some of Reba Cheap's flaws, and I do think we get to see Reba Cheap as a more flawed character than any of the other talking animals. Like, he has a temper. He's... Yeah, maybe a little too proud. He has these issues. Um, but we also see him being intrinsically good and noble in certain ways. And I think it makes sense for him from a character arc perspective, leaving aside the whole little dryad thing. Because like I said, I never actually really read that as a prophecy. If there's a fate element to this, it's in Reba Cheap's, like character itself that he's the sort of person who would do this. It doesn't bother me that this like very good, noble character who is absolutely fearless and I think that's like his biggest character point is that he is not afraid is the one that is able to venture into Aslan's country on his own terms and is the first person to do that I agree that the thing becomes kind of muddled with the previous idea of like talking animals are intrinsically good but no other talking animal like being intrinsically good doesn't necessarily mean that you can't be like other things within that Like, you can be intrinsically good and still be afraid and still be all of these different things. So for me, like, there has been no other talking animal or person or whatever to do this before. He's the very first person. And I think that that's still a choice. And I think that what is part of what's powerful for me about this scene is not only Reba Cheap's choice to do so and his completely embracing whatever fate happens without fear, or trepidation, but also this moment of like the kids saying goodbye to someone who's ready to like go, I think is what's most powerful to me is like understanding that at a certain point, like whether obviously the analogy here is most clearly tied to death, but like 
it could be other things too, that at some point you might have to part ways with someone who's dear to you and know that you'll never see them again. But accepting that that's something you have to do and facing it, you know, bravely and, and wishing them the best. And I think that's part of what's really powerful to me about this scene is, yeah, the twin the twin narratives of the kids letting Reepicheep go and Reepicheep choosing to go. I see what you mean about this sort of it's like processing the death of somebody. And, it, and it's very reminiscent of, you know, Return of the King when Frodo leaves for the Undying Lands. And that is done so much better. But again, J.R. Tolkien, better writer. I haven't actually <laughs> read that part of Return of the King, so cannot speak. Oh, interesting. Okay. I didn't ever read Return of the King. I read Fellowship and Two Towers. Oh, my And God. then eight-year-old me was like, I've suffered long enough. Morgan, how could you say this? Anyway, okay, I was this, eight years old. I forgive you. I forgive your eight-year-old self. <laughs> I didn't understand what was going on in those books. It's amazing I read that much. <laughs> oh, God. And you still didn't like Tom Bombadil as an eight-year-old? Oh, God, I hated him. He was so obnoxious. I actually liked the part with the, the barrows, though. Okay. That part I liked as a kid. Because it was creepy. We cannot no, go on this cannot. tangent back to this point yeah i i can see that what you're saying about grief the the grief of parting i think that's well done to me it just still doesn't feel like a real meaningful choice made on reap cheap's part and i think it's it's what you were saying that he always operates without fear and i think that's my problem with it if there was just a little bit of fear in there a little bit of doubt or hesitation like, I think the ambiguity that you refer to is like, we don't actually know what Reaper Cheap's fate is. Well, I guess we do because we see him in the last battle. Yes, we do. But we might not know his fate, but there's no question about his sort of dedication to taking this action. And that's what makes it less compelling for me because it's just like, it was his fate. They couldn't even really control it. it he was just intended to do this. And... That's where it starts to fall flat for me, where it's like it's this emotional beat, but the emotions don't have depth to them. To make a very unfair comparison, it's the way I feel like after every J.J. Abrams movie. Is there a big, giant, planet-sized weapon in, in Force Awakens? Yes. <laughs> and does it blow up? It does blow up. For those who hate it, I could not respect your opinion more. And for those who love it, I question your sanity. Where it's like in the moment, I really feel the emotion of a scene or or a certain moment. And it's only after when I'm sort of sitting with it and thinking about it, it's like, ah, uh, actually, I don't really like it. And I'm not sure why. And that's kind of how I felt with this book for a while until I kind of stumbled on upon this idea that his choice isn't really a choice in any meaningful sense. And that, that's not necessarily a problem with his character. I think it's just a problem with the setup that C.S. Lewis has made it very, very clear that animals are incapable of free will. All you have to do in that moment is give Reap a cheap free will, and it's essentially fixed. But I, I don't think that C.S. Lewis is giving animals no free will. He's giving them like no ability to be evil. But I don't think those two things are necessarily the same. I think that was the point I was trying to make, is that Reba Cheap does make a choice. Other talking animals would not necessarily make this choice. I don't think they would. I think this is something specific to Reba Cheap. I do agree that like he, that maybe the choice is, is, is less of a choice because he just is not afraid of anything. But that's also what I love about Reba Cheap, so I can't be mad about it. I think that him... Being absolutely the fearless in the face of everything is kind of amazing. And that's not the way other talking animals are at all. So I would argue he does have free will. He just doesn't have capacity for evil. And I think that those are somewhat separated out in this series. To me, it seems like having free will but being incapable of doing evil is an oxymoron. Because then you don't actually have the freedom to really choose it feels like more like you have these technical choices where it's like you can either pick the Pop-Tarts or the Oreos as 
like, I don't know. That's where you have the ability to choose. But that's not like compelling. Well, okay. Let's let's actually go back to Horse and His Boy for a minute. Because I think with Bree, we get an excellent example of a character that is intrinsically good, but is very flawed and makes some bad choices. He's a good horse, but he's like super scared. Uh, he doesn't believe in Aslan. Like he he is able to live a mediocre life, essentially. He's obviously goes through like character evolution in the book. But like I think that it's interesting because we're told that like talking animals don't have the ability to choose between good and evil, but I think that they're left a lot of room to be mediocre if they would like to be. I get what you're saying, and I do think like from a philosophical standpoint it makes sense, but I think that these books are trying to distinguish between those things. How successfully or not they're doing it is debatable, but like I I do believe Reba Chief has free will in this moment. I even assuming and that's a good point about Bree, but even assuming that Reba Chief has the ability to choose in this moment not to go, it's like, but of course he's going to go. And his flaws are definitely not played up anywhere near as much as they are for Bree. And so there is no doubt that he's going to go. So it just, it falls flat because there's no actual, like, sacrifice. There's no consequences, really, other than that Lucy's sad for a little bit. And then they meet a cute little lamb. I don't know. I guess it doesn't bother me. It doesn't bother me that Reba Cheap... I guess I don't need that for him. I don't need him to be doubting that because I don't think that's in his character. And I think if he did that, he would be a fundamentally different character. And I think, yeah, the consequences are that the people that are left behind have to like live without Reaper Chief, which is sad. But that, that's the thing is that they have to live without Reaper Chief, but they would live without Reaper Chief regardless because Lucy and Edmund have been told they'll never be coming back again. So this is the end, no matter what. Yes, we should we should probably uh, also bring in the ending for them and bake that into this little conversation. Sure. Um, because I do actually also enjoy this ending for them. Not necessarily the lamb bit, but I think I've been like alluding to this discussion for pretty much our entire podcast. The idea that like this is where I think Aslan fully reveals that like he is in all the worlds. Yes. This is when C.S. Lewis makes explicit what he is trying to do with his propaganda, which is to trick little children into thinking that Jesus <laughs> is a cute lion and they should worship Aslan as Jesus because he'll be cute and he'll breathe on your face. I mean, <laughs> which is not a bad strategy. I'm it's just not a say. bad I feel strategy. Like the Chronicles of Narnia books are way more successful at converting people than anyone gives them credit for. Yeah. But, um, yeah. I always find the moment, because we don't get to see Susan and Peter actually being told they're not going to come back to Narnia. And I think it's great that we get to see this moment for Lucy and Edmund, because I think obviously that's more powerful. And it all it always makes me a little bit melancholy too. Uh, yes, there is a lot of Christian propaganda in it, but I don't know. The whole part where like, hearkening back to the story that Lucy reads, and uh, she asks um, Aslan, uh, will you tell us how to get into your country from our world? And then Aslan says, I shall be telling you all the time. And it's just, the again, the pain. They've just lost this friend and let him go. And now they have to leave behind this part of their childhood. That This is their third time coming back. This is a huge thing for them. Both of them, especially Edmund, but Lucy too, have evolved so much because of this. And they have to essentially, like, this is them leaving their childhood behind because they're now too old. And I always think that that moment too is very... Powerful. Let me be clear. Just because I dismiss all of this as Christian propaganda doesn't mean that you're <laughs> not allowed to enjoy it. It's, it's an enjoyable story, and it is a very powerful moment. I just see through it for what it's trying to do, trying to brainwash children. And uh, you're, like, obviously not at risk of being brainwashed or anything. Or am I? Well, then fair enough. That would be interesting. What would Morgan as a fundamentalist look like? I'm, I'm not born to be a fundamentalist <laughs> anything. <laughs> You're a fundamentalist against uh, The Lion King is an adaptation of, of Hamlet. Oh, my God. Yes, that's correct. People who think that are wrong. <laughs> and I will fight them all. 
But I guess I'm a fundamentalist in that it's not, right? Yeah, exactly. But to get back to Reepicheep's ending, if you were to give Reepicheep a sense of doubt, he would be a a completely different character, which is why I advocate that Eustace should be the one to make that choice because he is the character who is operating with the most doubt throughout this whole story. And I think it just would have been... You know how you were saying that, like, your hair started standing on end when you were thinking about this ending with Reepicheep? When I think about my theoretical ending with Eustace and how it just been this culmination of growth and change for him into someone who's kinder and more patient and more compassionate, to have this culmination of him being like, I'm taking the leap of faith. I have no idea what's going to happen. I am terrified because in my version, they don't see what's behind the waterfall. I am terrified of what's beyond there. I don't know what I'm going to find, but I'm going to go because I feel called to do it. And I'm making that choice right now to go do it. And so you have a true actual embodiment of free will being acted upon by Eustace, this character who is truly amazing in his arc throughout this book. He's the most annoying character becoming the most heroic character. It ends the book on a freaking bang. I mean, Emmett and Lucy will have to try to figure out how to explain where Eustace disappeared to. Where is he? I don't know where, where he is. He found us. He must have friends. Friends. He met this guy. And they might end up going to jail for this, but that's okay. I'm willing to make that sacrifice for them. Oh my gosh. And- I don't know. I, I get what you're saying, but I do feel like I would feel a little bit unsatisfactory for me in a way because I feel like, I don't know, I feel like that would have been a very rushed character arc for Eustace for me. I feel like part of what I like is that, and I think I remember this in The Silver Chair, so I'm really hopeful that my vague memories are correct, that Eustace is still like a work in progress. Like, he's not at the point yet where he'd do that. I like that he's not, it didn't just take this like, what, month-long voyage to get him to the point where he'd do something like that. And I feel like if he did that, I, I would feel like it was too soon and I didn't buy it. And I mean, obviously, like, I don't think children should be sacrificing themselves. <laughs> I think one of the adults should have done it instead in that case. Well, that's fair. I think for me, it would have been satisfying even because as a work in progress, it would have been more meaningful that he decided then to make this action because it's like he would still be operating in this area of uncertainty about where he's going and yeah but i guess no go on sorry no 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 no. you you go after you oh no you first i couldn't think of it i guess i just like really wouldn't be able to buy him making that choice at this point for me i don't see it coming from a character standpoint i actually would see it more coming from edwin's standpoint because we've gotten so many like times in this book that harken back to like his previous status as a traitor who like Got Aslan killed, which I guess he knows now. They, like, were hiding that for a while, but he knew by the time they got to the the whole knife thing. So I guess Lucy and Susan have filled him in. So then after, like, three books of growing and getting to this point, I would have found it more interesting if Edmund did it. Um, And Edmund's also older, so I would have been at least a little more comfortable. (laughs) And I guess technically an adult, because he did live to, like, 30-something in Narnia land already. So True. I, I feel like if it had to be one of the kids, I would have argued for Edmund as the culmination of three books worth of growth. I would have bought Eustace's arc in that sense. So there. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not saying that it's it's perfect. I just feel like for me and like there's a lot of narrative problems with my version that would have to be addressed. Like what happens to Reaper Cheap? Does he in fact get eaten by the mermen? That would have been my preferred choice, but you know what a sick f*** I am. And then, like, how do you explain Eustace's disappearance? A lot of problems. But I, it just emotionally, thematically, it would have been so much more meaningful to me to have a character who has to make a real choice and really weigh that choice and, and think, like, is this something I want to do? I don't know what's going to happen to me. I don't know what's going to happen to everybody else, but I'm going to do it because... Somebody has to, and I I want to do this. That just would have been a cool moment for me. I think we'll have to leave this on agree to disagree. 
Comment. <laughs> Let us know what you think. <laughs> send us emails. Send us Facebook comments. Tumblrs. Tumblr. MySpace. Uh, I guess Twitter is also a thing. Friend book or whatever that was called. <laughs> Aim. Yeah. Hit us up. <laughs> Let us know. Let us know. Should the child have sacrificed himself? Okay. <laughs> Should the ending yeah. have been emotionally fulfilling and satisfying and not just cheap popcorn fare? Were my tears valid? Yeah. You get to choose unlike Reap a Cheap. <laughs> oh, so we've now reached the end of the book. Yes. They float along. They reach land. They see Aslan as a lamb in the most on the nose thing ever. And then Aslan reveals. Is there is there anything more to really say about the ending that, that we have? Inside? I already kind of commented on my feelings. So and I think my feelings are are clear. Like my eyeballs were rolling so hard. It's not that whole ending, but it's fine. Yeah, and then there's like the added paragraph that talks about what happened with Caspian and also like that. Eustace continued to improve and continues the, tr- the tradition of the last line of these books not being great. Yeah. But um, the first line was great. And so it makes up for everything. And you liked it. So really, this has been a win for all of us. I really did like this book. It's a romp. It's very entertaining. Magician's Nephew is still my number one because I think that thematically Magician's Nephew is just much, much, much more interesting. There's more of a through line that's taken to a conclusion that I actually thought was satisfying. But like, this book is great. A lot of stuff that doesn't make any sense, but it's weird and that's fun. Yeah, and there are things where like, if you want to dig into it, you can. And I think each of the islands present their own sort of philosophical or thematic puzzle for you. And it's nice because yeah, if you don't like one, like we didn't like the first one, you can move on to a new one. And I liked the ending, so... There you go. <laughs> I am so pumped for Silver Chair because I truly, this is the book I remember the least about. And I think it's really creepy. So I'm really hoping that I will love it. And I hope that I will continue to really enjoy Eustace and our new other main character, Jill. We will see. I have no memories of this book. I'm actually kind of looking forward to the last battle because there's all these different elements that are being set up. Yes. And I'm just so curious how it actually plays out in that book. I'm sure it will be disastrous, but I'm just curious to see it played out. Me too. But before we get there, we got the silver chair. yippity do that. Should we make another bed? I, I need to win back my meal. Well, uh, I don't, I don't know what I would bet about the silver chair because I really don't remember anything about it. So I, I feel like I, there's no grounds for, for a bet for me. And seeing as I'm the one who's won things, I have no reason to make a bet uh, for no reason. I suppose I will just have to live with the defeat. Indeed. Until next time, thank you so much for listening. Meow meow. That's the list. Oh, Tom Bombadil, what a lily spring And comes hopping home again Can you hear him singing? Hey, come, merry doll, merry doll and merry oh Go, the very gold, very merry yellow berry oh Poor old willow man, you tuck your ribs away